Good morning, church. It's good to see each and every one of you. I know I've been traveling a bit recently, and it's always good to be back home. The Lord blessed uh, in our, my trip to Peru this week, and I look forward to sharing shortly in a, in a uh, Vespers program more details about the mission trip that's coming up in March. And uh, so those of you who have been uh, already interested, you're definitely going to want to come out to that because I got a chance to meet the church and uh, get, get a, a feel for the whole area where we're going to be working. And it's a, it's a beautiful place, and God is really going to bless on that trip. So he worked it all out, and all the details are, are ready. And uh, so I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about our men's ministry backpack trip that we did last weekend. Uh, I don't think we've got a few of those guys here. Should be recovered by now, uh, but you know it's good to it's just good to go out in in nature and uh, be with be with uh, other believers. So we we just praise God for all the things God has done. And then here we know we had groups here for the last couple of weeks helping and working in our community. And and uh, you know the the church is just a big worldwide family. Amen. So whether you're here or in another country, whenever there's a need, God's people come together and help each other, and that's the beautiful thing about being part of the family of God. Amen. Amen. Well, in recovery literature, there's a saying that is often repeated in meetings. Half measures availed us nothing, right? In other words, when you enter into recovery, there are certain things that you have to do if you want to be well again. Um, And those things are often referred to as the 12 steps. Now, let me ask you a question. If someone enters into recovery, believes the 12 steps are a path to freedom from addiction, and they abide in the fellowship of the meeting, they read the literature, but they don't actually work the 12 steps, Will that person ever be well again? No, right? They're they're just going to be an addict with greater understanding of their own addiction. But but they're never going to experience freedom, right? And they're never going to be able to sponsor another addict. Why? They have all the knowledge. They believe in the program. They know the steps. They have the answers but they lack the most important quality for being a sponsor. What is that? Sobriety, right? They can talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk. Now, this is true for recovery, and we're going to be having a a whole series on addiction recovery. We had to postpone it. We were hoping to start it this week, but uh, because of the hurricane, we pushed it back a couple weeks. But you know, it, it is such an important challenge that, that many of us, not just in the church, but out of the church, are struggling with today. So, so if it's true that we have to take recovery seriously if we're going to overcome our addiction, how much more than when it comes to discipleship, right? Um, you know, you know the, the time in my life I knew the most about being a pastor? <laughs> It was when I was in seminary, right? You could always tell the guys in seminary who hadn't been a pastor because they had all the answers when we were in a class. And and those were the ones who would speak up the most. And I used to be one of those guys. I thought I had the answers. And then I went out in the field and worked for a couple years and came back, and I kept my mouth shut (laughs) because I realized I didn't know anything, right? (laughs) I didn't know anything about being a pastor, Um, And and that's what happens with knowledge, right? Paul even says that knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, right? So we have to get over this idea that knowledge equals discipleship. If I know it, then I'm a disciple. No, friends. If you do it, you are a disciple, right? Disciples follow Jesus wherever he goes, They don't just pay attention to him on their smartphone and say, yeah, Jesus is, I'm tracking him with my GPS, and I'm sitting at home. Mm -mm. That's why Jesus said in Matthew, 
chapter 16, verse 24. It's been kind of our anchor text throughout this series. He said, if anyone desires to come after me, what does he have to do? He has to deny himself, take up his cross, and what? Follow me. That means we have to what? Go somewhere if we're going to be a disciple of Jesus. Amen? And, and so through this series, we've seen that there are really four definitions or four main points of what a disciple is. A disciple, number one, is someone who hears, right? They are someone who believes the word. They hear the word. They believe the word. They abide in the word. And most importantly, they what? Obey the word of God. And what does that look like? We're going to be talking about today in part four of our series. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity we have today to be in your house. Lord, I pray that as we are struggling to put our lives back together after this storm, it's so disruptive. Even if our homes weren't damaged, Lord, it just disrupted our whole life and everything in our community, and Lord, but we still have to get back to the work that you've called us to do. So Lord, I pray that today our hearts and minds will be drawn to you, that you will inspire us, encourage us if we're feeling down, give us hope, give us confidence that you are with us, and may we obey what you call us to do. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, we, we also um, kind of introduced early on in this series the, the parable of the, uh, the sower, right? And, and that's, it's interesting because this, this parable really um, outlines these four principles so perfectly that we've been talking about when it comes to discipleship. And, uh, and so we know that, that the seed in the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13, we talked about this, represents what? represents the word of God, right? And, and we know at the beginning of the parable that one of the grounds, that hard ground, uh, the, the word hit that ground, and what happened to it? It never, it never got through. It was so hard, it just kind of stood on the top of the path, and what happened? The birds came and ate the seed, and, and essentially that represents someone who does not hear, right? They, 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 that's the hard ground hearer. Um, they, they, don't even, they don't even get past step one, right? What about, then there's, there was some seed that fell on some stony ground. It had a little bit of dirt, a little bit of stone, and, and we know that the, the, the parable says that that, 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 uh, that that plant grew up quickly, right? But what happened? The sun came out, and what happened to that plant? Yeah, it, it withered, right? Why? Because it never took root, so, so a, a disciple isn't just someone who hears the word, but they are someone who believes. And the belief is about taking root. But if, but if, uh, but if we don't um, grow in, in our belief uh, and, and we don't let that take root, um, we know that, that when trials and tribulations come, we'll, we'll give up on our faith. Now there's a third ground, right? The third ground was the was the thorny ground, right? So, so we know that in this example, the, 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 the ground, the person that represented by that ground, they, they heard the word of God, they believed the word of God, right? And, and, um, and yet, they, they never grew, right? They never grew because things in their lives choked out that belief. Uh, the cares and worries and, and uh, pursuits of life became more important to them than being a disciple. And so we know, according to the parable, that the, the thorns choked out the plant and it, and it died. But we want to be someone like that, the fourth ground, right? The fourth ground represents someone who, who hears the word, right? They believe the word. They abide in the word. And through that abiding, they obey. And there's a fruit that comes out of their life. And, uh, and so, but what happens when we get to that step three and don't make it quite to step four? Well, there's lots of examples of that throughout the Bible. Um, 
One of them is, a, is another object lesson that Jesus used constantly, but this, this is an interesting one. It's found in Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Mark chapter 11, verses 13 and 14. This is an interesting story. It's kind of like very, I think it's the only place in the Bible where we see Jesus actually uh, killing something. Verse 13, it says, And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Wow. It's quite, quite an interesting story here. Now, of course, we know later on they passed by and the tree was all withered up. And the question is, why, why would Jesus do this? Why, why would Jesus look at a perfectly good fig tree, had leaves and everything, and because it didn't have any fruit, he cursed it. What was he trying to teach here? You see, the tree looked good on the outside, but it produced no fruit. It was a fruit tree, but there was no fruit attached to it. And so when Jesus went to look for the thing it was supposed to have, it wasn't there. And so essentially the tree was a deception. And, and so this is both a, a warning and instructive for, for us as we evaluate our relationship with God. Christians who look good on the outside but practically produce no fruit in their life are just like that fig tree that Jesus cursed, right? Now, in the book of Revelation, Jesus referred to this condition as lukewarm, right? When he was talking to the church of Laodicea, he, he said, I, I would wish that you were hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will what? I will spew you out, right? Essentially, it's the same concept of, of, of being cursed. You're no longer connected to God anymore because you do not represent what you say you are. Hmm. If you say you're one thing, then the fruit should represent what you claim to be. So it's not enough just to hear the truth, believe the truth, even abide in the truth. We have to obey the truth. And that means producing fruit. Now, Jesus explains this, and I, sometimes we get confused about what, what this fruit that he's talking about really represents. It, 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 it's quite simple, but it, it's deep at the same time. But, but let's just dig into that a little bit. There's a whole section where he goes into detail on this, and uh, we won't have time to dig as deep as I would love to today, but let's just look at a couple of verses. Going back to John chapter 15, which, which is another parallel to this concept of discipleship that we've been talking about through this series. Chapter 15, let's look at verses 1 and 2 this time. And here Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he what? He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Just a side note there. Trials and tribulations in life for the Christian all things working together for good, as our, as our brother mentioned today, that's God's pruning in your life. God allows things to happen so that you will draw closer to him, and it hurts, but in the end, you get more fruit as a result. Just a side note there. But, but, but notice here, if we go to verse 6, we see the same concept. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are what? Burned. There it is again. So if we are not producing fruit, right? We already saw the fig tree, what happened to it? Withered up, right? 
What happened to the lukewarm water in Jesus' mouth? Spewed out, right? What happens to the branch here? It's thrown in the fire. Are we getting the picture? Yes, fruit bearing is not optional for the Christian. That's what Jesus is saying over and over again. It is the evidence that we are connected to the true source of life. And, and so the question is, well, okay, I get that, Pastor, but, but what are you talking about? What is this fruit? Well, it's, I think we, we've taught this since we were kids, if you grew up in the church, right? Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, right? We, we are told what this fruit is, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And sometimes we forget this last part. And against such there is what? No law. Okay. In other words, if we have these attributes in our life, these fruits, we will by nature be keeping God's commandments, right? Because against such there is no law. It's another way of saying, if you're doing this, you're, going, you're obeying the law. You're not breaking it. Um, and, and so obedience is not just adhering to the negative commands, right? We think of the commandments, and most of them are, thou shalt not. And we think, well, if I just don't do those things, I'm good. But that's just half, right? That's just half. And we call those sins of commission when we break the negative commands. When God says, do not commit adultery, and we commit adultery, that's what we call a sin of commission. We're, we're breaking something that God has forbidden us to do. But there are other commandments that are positive. There are things that God told us to do, and when we neglect to do those, those are called sins of omission, right? And they're just as important as the other ones. So when we're following the discipleship model, we're not only going to avoid doing what is wrong, but we're actually going to do what is right as well, right? And, and, and this was the dilemma that Paul was in. If you've ever read Romans chapter 7, remember, he wasn't just struggling with the sins of commission, he was also struggling with the sins of omission. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, those are the things that I do. Essentially, I'm sinning all the way around, <laughs> I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, and I'm doing the things that I'm not supposed to be doing. Yikes. Can we relate to that? Yeah. Amen? Amen, yeah. So, so that the solution for that dilemma is this model of following Christ. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Right? And we saw that this three-part uh, explanation, it is our, th this call to discipleship, it is, is illustrated in the, mo the, the, the sanctuary model. Amen? Isn't it beautiful? Just like there's three parts to following Jesus in his call, there's three sections of the sanctuary. Amen? There's the courtyard, there's the holy place, and there is the most holy place. Friends, we as disciples are called not just to the courtyard, not just to the holy place, but God has called us into the most holy. That is where God dwells and that is where God wants to be with you. Amen? Not just on the, yes, we have to follow the path to get in, but the goal is to stay in the most holy with God. Amen? Amen? That, that's the goal. That's what following Jesus means. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. That's the cross, amen? We have to die on the cross with Jesus. Let him, what? Take up his cross. That means we have to abide in Christ. We talked about what those three parts of the sanctuary represented. We saw that there was three elements in the holy place, three pieces of furniture, right? We have the candlestick the seven golden candlestick we have the table of showbread and of course we have the um, altar of incense and we saw that when we're here when we're taking up our cross this is abiding in Christ in that holy place we need to we need to the incense of course represents our prayer life the the light uh, of course in there represents the Holy Spirit in our hearts 
and the showbread represents the word of God. Those three things together allow us to abide in the word. But the goal isn't just to stay in the holy. The goal is to go into the most holy place, friends. And what piece of furniture is in the most holy? The Ark of the Covenant, right? Now, of course, not only does that represent the presence of God, but what in, is contained in that ark? The Ten Commandments, right? The Ten Commandments are there, right? So it represents not just the presence of God, but the law of God. It, it means that that is where we actually are obeying God's commands, Right? That's what gives us the right to stand before God. Those who are disobedient cannot be in the most holy. Only those who obey can stand in the presence of God. Amen? Because obedience right, represents uh, righteousness. And disobedience represents what? Sin. And no sinner can stand in the presence of God and live. We, so, so the whole plan of salvation is to move us from sinners to sinless. In the presence of God. So this is why we have to not neglect this fourth step. It's popular today in Christianity to say obedience doesn't matter. Just come, come. And I'm not saying that part's wrong. You do, we do need to come, right? But God just doesn't take us where we are. He points us into the sanctuary. And he says, this is the way. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Right? We have to follow Jesus through the sanctuary. That is what discipleship is all about. Now, notice what Ellen White said in, in the book Steps to Christ. Um, it's a beautiful quote here about the importance of, uh, of doing in the Christian life. God does not mean that any of us should become hermits or monks and retire from the world in order to devote ourselves to acts of worship. The life must be like Christ's life, between the mountain and the multitude. He who does nothing but pray will soon cease to pray, or his prayers will become a formal routine. When men take themselves out of social life, away from the sphere of Christian duty and cross-bearing, when they cease to work earnestly for their master who worked earnestly for them, they lose the subject matter of prayer and have no incentive to devotion. Their prayers become personal and selfish. They cannot pray in regard to the wants of humanity or the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom pleading for strength wherewithin to work. Wow. That's a really interesting quote. Um, because this right here shows how all these steps work not just in one direction, but the other. So what she's saying here is, we, we already know step one we have to hear, then we have to what? Believe. Then we have to abide in what we believe. In other words, what she's talking about, prayer. She's not saying that's not important. But if we don't go to obey, right, if we don't actually start doing what we are told to do or not do, right, then we lose the subject matter of our devotional life. And eventually we stop abiding, right? Our devotional life starts to fall apart, and then guess what? After a while, if our devotional life is not consistent, then the next step is we stop believing. Amen? We start questioning the things that we were taught, and we backslide into our old life. And before you knew it, we stop even hearing. And you know what? What is the step right after not hearing from God anymore? Jesus called it something specific. He called it the unpardonable sin, right? It's not because there's no sin that God can't forgive. It's because God can't forgive someone who cannot hear because they refuse to listen to what God has to say. 
And God lets them alone. He says, that's what you want. That's what you can have. But friends, that is a dangerous place to be, especially if you desire eternal life with Jesus. We have to look and examine our life. So, but when we look at this from the positive, right, we see that not only does God call the Christian to keep the commandments, of course, but there are so many other positive commands. And of course, the greatest is the commandment to make more disciples, right? That, that actually helps us in our personal walk with God. Do you know that? It's a part of helping us maintain that connection with God. It's not because God doesn't call us to make disciples because he, he, he wants, you know, to, to add to our, 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 our stress and, 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 and things that we've got to worry about throughout the week. No, when we think about making disciples, then it adds to our devotional life. It forces us to study the word more and, and believe more fully, right? And, and, it make, and it guarantees that we're going to be listening to God every day to see what he has to say. You see, when we, when we get out of our comfort zone, it strengthens all the other parts of discipleship. So, so God calls us to reach out to others it, just because it works back on ourselves just as much as it helps the person we're trying to reach. That's what I say when those go on mission trips. Yes, we're going to go and we're going to build a church in Peru. Amen? And they're going to appreciate that. But friends, there is just as much as you get back to helping strengthen your personal walk as the help you're giving to them. That's the whole reason why we do this. It is a blessing to give and it's a blessing to receive. And they go together when we follow Jesus. And so Jesus gave us a command. He said very plainly in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, that go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So friends, I think the command is clear, right? He said, go. But the question some of us say, well, how, how do I do it? How do I make a disciple? Well, it's, the, it's simple. We just, we just talked about it, right? It's the same way we became one ourselves. We, we teach, preach, talk, however you communicate. We communicate the gospel to somebody somehow, right? And then, we, and then when somebody receives that, then we, we teach them how to abide. How do I have a devotional life with God? And then we invite them to participate in our life so they can see what it looks like to obey, right? It is, it is incarnational and instructional. It is something that, that it in, in includes our, our, our whole life. It's not just a, a, a fraction of who we are. It's who we are completely that is going to make a disciple, now, today, we live in, a, in an amazing time where we can reach people that we would never see on a, on a day-to-day basis, right? So, so we've been talking about digital discipleship for, for a little while here, um, and we're going to be launching a group that uh, we're going to be inviting anyone to participate in who wants to learn how to be a digital disciple. So I, I took a class, I think a couple other people in here took the class uh, and I, I was not a uh, Instagram person, right? <laughs> like I, I had been kind of uh, at TikTok, Instagram. I was just kind of avoiding those two platforms. Um, and yet, for this uh, for this class, we we learned how to make these one one and a half minute videos. And uh, and so I I started out with zero uh, followers on Instagram. Um, after one month, uh, I think. I think I have 250 followers, which is, is pretty cool. But uh, the, the, the reason that those followers came was because we were, we were producing these short videos. And uh, one of the videos that I made, um, there, you can see the statistics up there for this video. So it's one video. Again, I didn't, I'd never done this before. So that means I wanted to see, that means we all are in that same boat, right? Uh, 
So, so this video, uh, it reached 6,168 people, right? 120, at that time I had 120 followers, so hey, I, and, and it says it reached 6,048 people that were not followers of my account. Wow. And of those 6,000, right, how many people liked the video? See the heart button there? Over 1,000 people. That means that over 1,000 people not only watched the video, but put pushed like. Now, if you're on social media, you know that you don't like everything that you see on there, right? <laughs> you're, you're, so so th that means it made an impact in their life, right? And the other ones are people, comments, those are shares and bookmarks. Well, I'm just sharing this with you because my point is if I can do it, you can do it, right? Because I didn't, I'd never done it before. And I just said, I'm going to try it, right? This is one video, right? There's maybe 250 people here today that can hear this sermon. I, sp I spent a couple hours working on this video and reached 6,000 people, right? And made an impact on 1,000 of people that I don't even know who they are. But the point being is that today you can reach, how long would it take to knock on 6,000 doors? <laughs> and, you know, seriously, so, so God has opened up opportunities today to reach people like we've never had in the history of the world, right? And he says, go, go and share what you have experienced. Share, it doesn't have to be something like, like, uh, deeply theological. Most of the best liked videos are the ones that people can relate to. And sometimes your simple experience with God will be much more powerful than a pastor's or a theologian could ever do because you're sharing your experience. So if you're interested in learning, there is a kind of a formula that we learn for this that helps when you're, when you're putting this together for scripting, um, you know, what, what you but it, 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 it isn't that hard. It just takes practice and a desire. And so I was thinking, I was like, you know, what are the, what are, everybody kind of falls into four categories when it comes to this, I, I would say. So everyone in here today, uh, you know, when we, we think about doing something we've never done before, there's, it's usually, th 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 there's four things that are, that, that, uh, four categories that we're in, right? So the first category I'd say is that people, that, there's people in here who says, well, I don't want to, and I don't know how, right? <laughs> so there's some people who say, oh, Pastor, I, I, I don't, I have no interest in making a video. And anyway, I don't know how, right? So that, that's, that's uh, one group of people here today. There's another group that says, I know how. I'm pretty good on social. I do lots of things on social, but I don't want to share my faith online. I just feel like that's personal and I don't want to offend anybody, right? So, so that's the other group, right? I, I know how to do it, but I don't want to. Then there's another group here who says, I want to. This sounds interesting, but I don't know how, right? So that, that's the category I was in uh, a, few, a little while ago. I, I was like, man, th th this, this seems so cool, but I, I don't know how to do it, right? And then there's the fourth one. I, I want to, and I know how. Some of you here today probably, uh, you know, uh, fit into that category. But um, I, I don't know how to, you know, move you from, from uh, the first <laughs> category to the last one, but I do know how to move uh, someone from the second, or thir third to the fourth, right? So if, if, if this is something that you want to do, right, if you want to learn how to, to, to share your faith, online, um, and you don't, you just don't know how, then let me know, because we're going to, we're going to get a group together that's going to meet um, every week, and we're going to support each other, and we're going to, we're going to try and fail together, <laughs> because I didn't show you my bad videos, but I will for the group, right, there was probably one where I only got 30 views, okay, so it's not always, you know, peaches and cream, you have to have a group that, that kind of helps, you know, you'll have some good, some bad, but the point is you're on a journey together. And, and, and Jesus didn't say, you know, you have to bat a thousand when you're, when you're making disciples. You, you don't have to, you, don't ha you can strike out as many times 
as it takes. He, he didn't say, he didn't tell you what your batting average had to be. He just said, just get up to the plate and take some swings, right? And one time you're going to hit a home run. One time, even if it's a thousand times that pitch comes, you're going to eventually hit one out of the park. And that's the point. That moment will come and you're going to see whether it's face to face or online. The point being is that when we take God's call seriously, it's going to strengthen your faith and you're going to have a more fulfilled life by following Jesus. So um, I, I encourage you to, to come up to me today, uh, this week, whenever. Uh, let me know, and we're going to be putting that group together soon. Uh, so uh, let, we're going to invite the praise team up at this time. We're going to sing a closing hymn called Bringing in the Sheaves. And uh, that's the goal, right? We want to... We want, that, we want to see that harvest, right? Remember the parable ends with some thir- we all pro- those who make it to the end produce 30, 60, 100-fold. God is going to do the work, but we have to be willing to let him use us. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for calling us out of sin into righteousness, Lord. You've taken us from a dark place, and you've called us into the beautiful light of your gospel and your love, Lord. And I pray that we will not get weary on the journey, Lord, that we will not try to take a shortcut either, Lord, that we will follow you all the way into the most holy, Lord. Help us to obey, Lord. Help us to abide, to believe, to hear, Lord. We want to be your disciples, Lord, bringing in the sheaves, Lord. So may we all be be revived and encouraged to do and go for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.